Um, we're recording now, and people are coming in. So, hello everyone. It's great to see so many faces popping up there. Um, we might give it a, a minute to see if a few more people join um, before we, we get started. But thank you for all of those who, who are there. Um, you might notice I don't have my virtual background today. I'm working off a different computer. Unfortunately, when we were doing one of the virtual tastings the, back in 2020, I ended up spilling my jug of water all over the laptop. <laughs> and that's off for repairs. It'll be two weeks before I get it back. So um, there'd be no virtual background in the meantime because this laptop doesn't support it. But there you go. Now, you, this is behind the scenes, the real, the real deal, <laughs> my spare room. Um, so we'll give it one more second there, guys. No one's come in in the last minute since I said that, so maybe it is best we just get get going. Um, so yeah, so guys, I'll just get started. So um, folks, for those of you on the chat who don't know me, my name's Luke. I'm the manager of the Celtic Whiskey Bar down in Clarny. We are the world's largest collection of Irish whiskey, um, but we also have a phenomenal Scotch collection. We probably over 600 different bottles of Scotch, and one of our uh, our selections is a is a kind of little Campbelltown shelf, um, and on there is Springbank, Hazelburn, Longro. Um, so one of my favourite brands. When I was first getting into whiskey and uh, as a young bartender, and all I knew was kind of your regular Irish blends or your red breast, uh, Springbank was one of the first distilleries that I was introduced to that really kind of you know kind of opens the door to being a whiskey nerd, <laughs> where you realise that these kind of brands exist and the, the kind of the uh, green labels or, or you know red. Longer Red and, and the Springbank 15 phenomenal uh, whiskies. So um, really excited about this chat and excited to have Grant here with us. So if you want to tell us, a, tell everyone uh, who's joined us tonight, Grant, a bit about yourself and we'll get going with our tasting. Yeah, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Grant McPherson. I'm the UK sales manager who cover UK and Ireland. I've worked for Springbank for 21 years. So 1st of May 1999, when I was a, a boy, so yeah, I started working for Springbank uh, in the shop in based in Campbelltown, responsible for the west coast of Scotland sales. Um, we just travel up and down the west coast of Scotland, uh, visiting bars, restaurants, etc., and shops selling the Springbank products. Worked in there for about five years, and then a position came up for being in the sales and marketing for Caddenhead's sister company. So. I uh, moved on to sales and marketing for Cadden Heads for about five, six years. And so I used to travel around the world doing all things related with Cadden Head sales. And then a shop manager position came up, um, which perfectly timing when I just wanted to settle down a bit of family life and stuff like that, I had kids. So I worked as a shop manager for about five, again, about five, six years. And then they asked me if I wanted to go on the road again and be the UK sales manager. And I thought, jump to the challenge. And yeah, here I am now, six years later, working uh, for Springbank in the sales and marketing for the UK and covering Ireland. So yeah, travel up and down the, the UK and across the island and tastings, trade shows, etc. So great company to work for. Um, I mean, for me, getting into whiskey, born and bred in Camelton, lived in Camelton all my life, so it's got a huge heritage about making whiskey and stuff like that. And during my time at university, I used to work in the Arch Sheila Tell, it's an excellent whiskey bar in Camelton. So that's where I started learning about whiskey. And then I used to know the bosses and the directors and that for Springbank. And yeah, it was, the job came up just perfect timing when I finish university and jumped at the chance. So yeah, cannot complain at all. Marvellous. No, not a bad job, I'd say. Um, <laughs> no, and fantastic brand to be working for. I'd always um, say if I ever left Celtic, you, you, you'd love to work with a brand that you can throw so much trust behind, you know, as opposed to just peddling whiskey for the sake of it, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and it's a, a great company to work for because anybody who's I went about talking about whiskey. We've actually got to go and work at the distillery. So I've been and done the malting, mashing, distilling, worked in the bottling halls. So it's easier when you've been there physically, done the process to talk about it 
I mean, yeah, you can get a bit of paper and a book to read up on it and stuff like that. But no, physically doing the work at the distillery, you get a better insight to what the, what the process is. So anybody who's out and about even doing tours, tastings, etc., has to go and work at the distillery for a wee bit. So yeah, that's fantastic. Um, speaking of making the whiskey, maybe we could we could get our first whiskey poured. Um, yes, indeed. So first whiskey tonight is the Springbank Twelve Year Old Cask Strength. This one is bottled at fifty-five point three percent alcohol. So the Twelve Year Old Cask Strength is actually it's bottled twice a year. It is a limited edition product uh, that we produce uh, twice a year. So normally the, the core range of Springbank uh, we talk about is the 10, the 15, um, the Hazel one 10 year old and the Long Roll. That's the kind of core range of Springbank. And then we have limited edition products like 12 year old cast strength, Springbank 18, 21 year old, 25 year old. These are all limited edition products that are bottled are once a year in a very small long terms. Yeah, the 12 year old cash strength. This was usually about 10,000 bottles for this one here. Uh, so, say 55.3. The makeup for this one is 65% bourbon and 35% sherry cask maturation. So, normally we keep, you try and keep this a recipe similar for the 12 year old cash strength, but over the last few bottlings, it's actually changed slightly. Normally, the 12 year old cash strength's got a more sherry to bourbon ratio but this one here is actually more bourbon to sherry. And why is that? Uh, again it's just looking at stocks um, and we're more kind of looking at the future now of what we want to like when we're filming the cast we want to say that okay that's getting matured on at 10 year old that's getting matured on at 15 year old and we're getting more sort of volumes and so we can do that. There were certainly years of production where we filled casks, we might have got more bourbon casks in than sherry, and then the next year we've got more sherry casks in towards bourbon. So it's a, we're trying to make sure we can fill the kind of same portfolio every year so we can control our uh, stocks better, shall we say. Mm -hmm. say <laughs> even nicer the Spring Mike 21 we're trying later on. This year is quite unusual mix to it, but it's a crack and drum, but the cast makeup of it is quite unusual, but we'll talk about that later on, same time. A little tip yeah. later, guys, keep you on the keep you on the Zoom. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so this one here is quite a lot, a lot of floral notes to it. Um, you know, you get that sort of kind of light burnt embers and sort of in the nose, and that comes through in the palate as well. Like sort of peaty uh, this too, and very very lightly peated. And in Springbank, we do three different styles: uh, hazel one, Springbank, and long rose, so unpeated lightly peated and the long goes a bit more heavily peated. So we're catering for all markets from one distillery, shall we say. Now I've got a wee little presentation with some uh, pictures and videos to show you just to give you an insight to Camelton and stuff like that. Now a wee bit of history about Camelton itself. Camelton used to be described as the whiskey capital of the world. It used to be approximately 34 distilleries in Camelton. Now people ask us why so many distilleries in such a small town? And the reason behind it is, well, one of the main reasons is this picture in front of you is Camelton Loch, where basically big ships used to come in, loading up with whiskey and taking it across to the Ayrshire coast for big lending companies. So it suited the area. And also the coal mine just outside Camelton at Macrahanis, all the farmers growing the barley and stuff as well. So we hold all the main ingredients for making whiskey in Camelton. Unfortunately, Things changed, the prohibition, etc. A big sort of whiskey boom where uh, a lot of distilleries in Camelot started cutting corners and ended up closing down. Where there was only there were th only three left now: Springbank, Glengyle, and Glen Scotia. But we are still recognised as a whiskey producing region, so we are still on the map. So that's um, That was if, uh, I don't know if, if it's apocryphal, but uh, someone was telling me a long time ago now that 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 the region's kind of accreditation was was in, in, in the balance. Is that is that true or? Yeah, I mean, around about the year 2000, uh, the Scotch Whiskey Association were trying to say, no, Camelton, you're no longer a region. They wanted to classify it as a Highland region. Around about that same time, we were thinking of reopening Glengyle Distillery. And we went back to look, there soon might be three distilleries in Camelton. 
at that point there was three distilleries in the lowland region and we were thinking, look they're a region so why can't we keep a regional status especially with the history the heritage in capital and that came back and said okay if there is three distilleries we could keep a regional status so um, it got us kind of moving things along quicker with reopening Glengyle and it certainly took us four years but we got Glengyle up and running again in 2004 so yep put Camelton back on the map. Brilliant. Uh, there's, obviously you can see Cam's lock in the distance there, but we've also got a, a huge military presence back in the day for, this is actually one, well, one point, this was actually the, the third longest runway in Europe. You can see 1.8 miles, um, so just outside Cam's on the Mac the Hannes, so uh, it used to be our old military base, and you see, see Camelton, so not too far away from Camelton. That's actually not too far away from where the, the coal mine was, where we got coal for the, the boilers, etc. And a lot of the, the farmers were the, producing the barley in that forest as well. There's some more pictures of Camelton. Well, it's up the back of Springbank. There are some videos in this. There's the the water source as well. So we've got to, back in the 1700s or late 1700s, there was a purpose built loch called Cross Hill Loch to supply the water source for the distilleries of Camelton. And to this day, we still get a water source from Cross Hill Loch. That's that, the, the barley loft. So we're actually, Springbank's founded in 1828 and at present the uh, chairman is the great great grandson. So it's still in the same family as its original founders. And we're actually the only distillery in Scotland that can say we do 100% of the production process on site from start to finish. Do everything from malting to the, the bottling, 100%. Yes, there might be a few other distillers that say they do the malting process, but if you start asking them questions, do you do it all themselves? No. Uh, we keep our production relatively slow, so we can do everything on site. So it's Scottish grown barley uh, right through to the bottling process as well. There's a, so this is up in the, the barley loft, uh, which I actually just use for the local barley. Yes, I say that it's only Scottish grown barley we use, but we do ask uh, some of the local farmers in the area to grow barley. So, well, so all the local farmers will come to the barley loft. Very, very labour intensive. What's, what's going on here, um, Grant? So, what we're doing here is filling the steep. Uh, there's a picture there. So that's the, just what you've seen the guys doing in that video there, that's them filling, taking the barley from the loft and putting it into this steep, it's a big bathtub. Now what we want to do is start the germination process and we put the, the barley into the steep and we add water to it to get the water content of the barley up to about 48%. So that's what we're doing there. So like so the, the barley was up in the loft there, that's the local barley. We've got to leave it up there for a dormancy period, usually about three months before we can go into the germination process or start the germination process. Uh, so it's very, very labour intensive. Um, this is one of the reasons why a lot of distillers don't do it or maybe go down the route of drum malting, etc. because of the, the time consuming factor in this and then it's so labour intensive. And, and I know we, we, we did a Tasting with Ecklinville um, a couple of months ago, or I don't know, lose track of time with all the different lockdowns, but um, they do all their, they're in Northern Ireland and they do all their um, their own malting and they have a local farm supply and they find that they often have to stop distilling at certain parts of the year because they, they can't, their malting can't keep up with the, the distillation depending on, or their, their barley production because it's all, the, all their local barley. Would you ever encounter a similar um, yeah, well, funny you say that because if you came to Springbank three years ago, it was the same team that did the malting that done the distillation. The normal cycle back in the day for us was two months malting, two months distilling, two months malting, two months distilling. Basically, the same guys move with the process. Um, and that limited us to what we could produce per year. And if you asked me three years ago what we produced, I would have said about 120 thousand litres. 
Now we're up to about 250,000 litres because we basically doubled our production because we've got a full team doing the malting process and we've got a full team doing the distillation process. So yes, uh, it works for us. Uh, we can still do the guys doing the malting throughout the year and basically distilled throughout the year. So we do, what we do now is seven months distilling at Springbank and then we're three months distilling at Glengyle. The Glengyle distillery is actually only producing for three months of the year. Uh, but see, the Stillman are working seven months at Springbank. Very good. So the guy's got to go in and shovel the barley out after doing the steeping process. To give you any idea of the steeping process, they've got to put, fill this, this, the steep up for about 12 hours, drain it, fill it up for another 12 hours, and drain it, and that sort of gets the water content up to about 48%. And then say so you go in there, they've got to like shovel the barley out of the steep uh, onto the malt floors, and then they've got to spread it evenly across the, the malt floors. Now, the way they've done it, they've only done half of it there. The way we do our cycle, that actually starts about six o'clock in the morning, the end of the steep. The next shift comes in about eight o'clock, so they do the other half. So that's the way it works. So that's why there, you can only see half of the steep empty there. And then, so you can see in the background the steep with the barley sort of outside of it. And then the guys basically, they'll shovel the barley evenly. It's usually about six inches deep onto the malt floors. This all depends on time of year, etc. Because there's no heat source in the malt floors. The only way you can control the temperature is opening and closing the, the windows in the background. So during the summer months, the windows are open to try and keep the, the place cool. But during the winter, uh, everything's closed and trying to keep the heat in. Because the optimum temperature for the germination process is about 16 degrees Celsius. So that's the way we control that. And that's why every so often we've got to turn the barley or grub it, as I say, to express some of the heat out of the barley and stop it knitting together. You know. That's the, the grubber, so that's basically a, a kind of plug like system, big rake that they'll use for dragging through the barley. Also got an electric turner there in that photograph, which makes things a wee bit easier. That's a grubber there. A little video here. <laughs> Simple as. You'll see just in the background there, there's a little thermometer. So there's about three thermometers laid out the floor. So every so often the, the mallsman will check the temperature and make sure it's not keeping above 16 degrees Celsius. And everything's recorded by hand in a, a book. So it's very, very old fashioned machinery we use and no computers at all at Springbank. So it is literally the old fashioned way of making whiskey. Gordon Lawler there in the chat says it must be lovely smell in that warehouse. Um, I suppose would, you would get that kind of porridge oaty smell that you do get from a, from a mash bill, I imagine. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly it's, when we're doing the tours, we, we like to show everybody the whole process. You'll get to see the malting, mashing, distilling, um, the warehousing and then the bottling hall. And it's amazing the smells at every different stage. Mm. Uh, especially it is a kind of rich maltiness when you straight step into the malt floors. And then obviously when you're passing the kiln, you get a nice little peat reek, shall we say. And then in the still house, you get a nice sort of, kind of spirit driven, uh, and then in the warehouse and stuff as well. It's, yeah, it's amazing the different scents at every every stage in the process. No, it is, it is one of the, my favourite bits of visiting a distillery. I've been to, to dozens and dozens of distillery, but I actually haven't been to a malting house yet. So, but, um, but it is those, yeah, those smells that hit you. Even, even when you're a few feet away from the door, you know your brain automatically knows what you're about to experience. Yes, yeah. yeah. As soon as you walk in, uh, we've got a few different warehousing uh, at Springbank and we've got sort of racked and dunnage. And it's amazing the, the difference when you walk in the different types of warehousing. So the rack warehouse is it's more that kind of, you smell the, the spirit, shall we say, whereas you walk in a dunnage warehouse, it's that damp, earthy note from the, the earthen floor. So yeah, it's, that's good. Excellent. Um, so this is our kiln, is it? 
the kiln indeed, yeah. So after we've done the, the malting process, now on the, the, the barley's on the, the floor there for approximately six days. And it all depends on times of year. So during the summer months, it's five days. During the winter months, it's a bit longer. It takes about seven days for the germination process to, to kick in and stuff like that. So want to get a certain stage, you want to stop that germination process. And we do that by putting the barley into the kiln and drying it down to about 4% moisture. So you want to stop that germination process by drying it basically. This is going to be the first difference between the three styles of spirit we produce. So here's the one as I said, it's unpeated. So we do not use peat at all during the drying process. In here, it's into the kiln, but then we use a hot air machine. So it's a big hair dryer, blasting hot air through the barley and drying it off that way. For spring bank, it is peat smoke dried for about six hours and then a hot air machine for a further sort of 24 to 30 hours. And that makes the, the PPM level of the barley approximately 12 to 15 parts per million, so lightly peated. And then for long roll, it's fully peat smoke dried for about 48 hours um, using sort of say peat only. So it's constantly shoveling peat into the, the kiln and drying it off that way. So basically above the, the fire there, there's a metal mesh where all the, the peat, sorry, all the, the barley will be sitting top of. So all that smoke is traveling up through the barley, drying it off and getting infused with that peat smoke characteristics. Again, very, very labor intensive because they've got to physically shovel Emptying the floor from the, the malt barns, we've got to shovel it into wheel barrels and put it onto a conveyor belt, take it and drops it inside the kiln. But after we've done the kilning process, when it's cooled down slightly, we've got to go inside and empty it by hand. So that's inside the kiln. So you can see them wearing masks, etc., because it is quite a, a dusty environment. And that's basically a metal mesh the barley sitting on the top of. And then they've got to sort of shovel it into a corner and they use a, an over system, a quarter screw system to lift the barley up and takes it onto an arc and belt and drops it into one of the malt bins we've got at Springbank. I'd say the smell in there is incredible. <laughs> mm. that is, it's very biscuity. That's the best mm. way to describe it. It's very malty, biscuity, and it's even, you can actually eat the barley and it's that kind of crisp. Uh, especially when it's nice and warm, very, very edible. You know, it's, it's really nice. Well, I used to do uh, tasting classes at the Irish Whiskey Experience and, and some people would really struggle with the peated. We always finished on a peated option. Um, if we're on the, the, what was called the Distillers Apprentice, your kind of introductory course, the kind of base level one you could do. And, uh, you know, it was always, you know, it's a cliche, but that kind of marmite. Some people just couldn't stand the, the peat. But, um, a fellow I know from who, who works with a, a peated whiskey brand in Ireland gave me some barley, some peated barley. And if you give people a taste of the, the peated barley, got them to chew and handle and feel the peated barley, and then give them the peated whiskey, you almost invariably got a much better reaction. You know, it was almost like their brain could calculate better what, why yeah. they were getting these flavors from their whiskey. You know, I found it fascinating the kind of how quickly that alters people's perception. It's quite yeah. shocking, as well, the, the one we had anyway was. Yeah. It seems because obviously we see the to us yes we know the PPM of long row is quite high it's about you know about forty five to fifty parts per million but on the nose and palate it's not an in aggressive peaty smoky whiskey mm -hmm. but a lot of people are kind of they're waiting for that peat smoke hit and it's not there but it's nice it's subtle and I just claim long row is a kind of introduction to the peat smoke influence you know, or stepping stone to Isla. So well, I was, I was a, a friend of mine was, was asking me for a Scotch whiskey recommendation last year, or I can't remember when, but at some point recently enough. And uh, I said, I'll oh, try the Springbank 15. So afterwards, I said, oh, what do you think? And he said, oh, it's, it's too, too peated for me. And I was thinking, I wouldn't, you know, in, in my world, it wouldn't even, it would barely, I know we were talking about how it is, you know, it is 12 ppm or whatever, but it wouldn't register, you know, <laughs> compared to some whiskeys. But there you go. Yeah, it's the Springbank 15, which we're, we're going on to next, so we can maybe just to start describing that one as well because the Springbank 15 year old is actually fully matured in sherry casks. So yes it is lightly peated but because it's fully matured in sherry a lot of people think or in the nose and the palate it's got heavily peated so your influence to it, but it's actually it's more the kind of sherry cask influence they're getting through in the nose and palate. Because this one 
some people just basically describe this one as a Christmas cake in a glass because of that kind of rich satana raisins, nuts, a lot of kind of nutmeg type of notes to it. You know, as you expect with sort of Christmas time or a nice sort of heavy sherry whiskey. Again, it's no, there's no kind of sulfury notes to it. It's a nice sort of balance of the sherry. It's not, most of it is first fill, but there is some second fill sherry cast in this one to sort of to make it balanced out, shall we say. It's a nice sort of sweetness to it, but it's not overpowering sort of sherry cask influence. So before we jump too far into this, into that 15, um, the, we had a couple of questions about the, the 12 year old. Um, I know we got this stock in, um, back at the end of the summer, I suppose, around then. So is it, the, the Nicholas asks, is this 2021 edition for the 12? Well, so the 55.3% is actually the February 2020 release. Uh, so there is, everyone's out of sync. Normally the, the 12 year cast strength is bought in February and August. Because of the pandemic and our our schedules out the window, because the next cast strength is coming out in April. Uh, but yeah, normally it's February and August time, so twice a year type thing. But this one here is the February twenty twenty release. Um, and I'd love to hear some some tasting notes from from the the chat. Um, it definitely is much more bourbon on the the palate than than the nose would suggest. I know we mentioned the the different casks, but I I thought it was quite sherry just personally on the nose, but um, I found it to be very, personally, very, uh, lots of vanilla, honey, a touch of green grass coming through. Yeah. Um, uh, it is quite, I, I must say, I do get the bang as well. <laughs> it does, it does feel like, 50, I'm after adding a drop of water, but when it, while we were going through the slides, I was thinking, poor, that is, that does pack a bunch. Um, so, yeah. It's buzz going. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you get that sort of lovely floral notes to it in the nose, you kind know, of wood chipping, candy, ginger. Palette wise, it's got rich, nice sort of salty, caramel, biscuity note to it. Mm. There's that. There is that gentle peat smoke in the background, and there's a lot of people describe Springbank as quite a dirty, earthy sort of style to it, and you get that coming through as well. Time my dear, so it kind of walking into our warehouse number three, which is that. That earthy note from the Danish warehouse. That candied fruitiness and, and um, that you mentioned, I, I definitely picked that up on the nose, but definitely more so after adding a drop of water. Do you know, it really, for me, it helped, it helped it breathe. Um, yeah, certainly. And uh, for us as well, I mean, my preference is not to add water to any of these whiskies, but that's certainly my way. But when we, the great thing working for Springbank as well, that the sales team are directly involved, it goes on to the market. So we get to try everything before they go into the market and put our, our influence to it as well, type thing. And uh, when we're getting the samples done, we always try and experiment, you know, with water. We get them done with cast strength, water down at 46 as well, maybe add a bit more water to see how it develops, if it opens up with water, and type thing. And it's amazing to see some whiskies totally open up with whiskey, some just basically dissolving it, nothing will a splash of water. And it's, it's interesting to see the, uh, and it's, usually about six or seven is in the office it does this and everybody's got their own opinion and that's a great thing as well it's not one person saying that's the best whiskey you know it's a kind of majority of what we go to as well type of thing because everybody's palate's different and sometimes when we're doing the tasting notes it's not just one person doing the tasting notes because that'll be his perspective on it it is usually sort of say three or four of us putting together the tasting notes so you get a kind of variety of the flavor profile to it and yeah, so we can sort of do that way. It is, you know, it is very subjective. That's the, the, the beauty of whiskey, do you know? And that's what, um, you know, kind of also always attracted me to when you go to early tastings and people cared about your opinion. It wasn't like, you know, if you're doing wine tasting, sometimes they're like, this is the notes you're getting from the whiskey, from the drink, you know, whereas with the whiskey, with whiskey tasting, it's always like, oh, you get that, oh, that's interesting. I get that too. Do you know, it's great to have that, um, that kind of freedom and ability to, to share your, your opinion, you know, and not... It, and it, it does, you know, you start saying there's orange peel in that, your mind will be, that orange mm. peel will be, so you'll start looking for it. Oh, there is, and so uh, But no, it's, it certainly is great. Mm. Yeah, well, one of my favourites is a cast strength. I always, every time I go back, 12 year cast strength is one of my favourite drums. It's funny because years ago, back maybe 15 years ago, I used to love the Springbank 15 year old. 
but I find a bit too sweet for my liking for the too much sherry cask influence. And it's amazing how some people their palates change over the years. I think. Well, I remember the first time I tried the fifteen. As we kind of come onto that one now, um, I didn't. I didn't in, in, initially like it. Uh, I thought it was there was something salty and almost soapy at the back of my mouth, and I was like. I'm not like everyone I was drinking it with was like, oh, this is a phenomenal whiskey. And I was like, oh, I don't know about this. Um, but I wasn't confident enough at the time to be like this, you know, it's maybe six years ago and I five years ago. And I was like, not brave enough to kind of say, oh, I'm not, not so sure when everyone else was saying it's amazing. And since it's become like probably one of my go-to whiskeys uh, of all, all the Scotch brands out there, you know. Um, so it's amazing how, I don't know, I often wondered is, was that that particular batch year or was that just my own palate de developing? I don't, I don't know. I mean, the truth is I love it now. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah, because technically, yeah, spring might all their products are batch release, so there might be a slight variation from year to year or bottling to bottling. We do see 15 of yeah, it's 100% sherry cask, but sometimes there might be more first fill sherry cask towards refill sherry cask. So, yeah, occasionally you might get one that's a bit more sweeter from the sherry cask than the other years, but that's the uh, what people love about spring bank. And of course, we don't chill filter, we don't add caramel coloring, so they're all all natural type thing because people do look at the colour of the whiskey and it's like oh they sort of dark colour and stuff no these are all totally natural no caramel colouring added whatsoever so tell us uh, as we come on to the 15 what's the the where you source your your sherry cast from so yeah i mean every couple of years the, well, maybe not just now we, our distillery manager will go out to Hareth, uh, and basically source the cast directly. So we, because we're a relatively small distillery, we can basically go and source our own cast directly. So I've got contacts um, and we'll go out and yeah, it's mostly all the also sherry casts direct from uh, um, that we'll source, shipped over whole, we don't break them down. Uh, so they're basically shipped over straight to the distillery. And so there's a lot of goodness in them. They're not a chance to dry out, etc. cetera. Um, over the last five years, we have bought in various different types of sherry uh, to do a kind of sherry series type thing. So we've got different kind of sherry casts maturing away to do a uh, Springbank sherry series. But I'm not mention too much because it's a bit of a surprise in years to come. So over the next couple of years, you'll see a limited edition Springbank series starting with about six different types of sherry. So you can see the between the difference between all the also fino, manzanella, etc. Uh, so yeah, the, all the casts are sourced directly, shipped over whole to Springbank. Um, and that's the great thing, having that direct relationship with straight to uh, our supplier in Spain. It's not through a broker uh, who, who, are trying, who maybe might not know exactly where the, the cast have been or what, what, uh, what cast, how long they've been used for, etc. But no, we know the, the history of these casts when we're purchasing them over. To them. Same with the, the bourbon cast we use as well. Yes, most of them are come from the uh, space like Cooperage, but certainly uh, we've got a kind of reputation that like we've got a clientele built up, but we know exactly what cast we're getting, type thing, so, which is a huge part of the distilling process. Yeah, you can make good spirit, but your sort of cast management's got to be really good as well. What to uh, what you're putting your spirit into? Oh, 100%. And you mentioned you've got uh, racked warehouses and uh, donage system going, is it? Yeah, so we've got, uh, we've just built a new one uh, there recently, but uh, yeah, we've got mostly uh, racked warehouse, but there's like four done it. So there's about eight warehouses at one site. Um, most are sort of racked, but there's a few done wise as well. The new one will be sort of a bit more modern, sort of racked. We didn't want to go down the route of palletized, but it's, uh, it's racked or done it warehouse we use at Springbank. Um, and the new one we built was basically because we upped our production over the last couple of years, the, we needed the storage space. So we had to basically, we, had a, we know what, how many casts we can store on site, etc. right? How many years can we go before we need a new space? And so within two years time, we've got this, we need to start using this new warehouse. But, uh, so we built it, we were only planned on using half of it or get the rack, racking in one half of it uh, over the next year and then a couple of years time we'll need to get other half rack type in here so mm. yeah everything's matured on site so a lot of distilleries will maybe use central belt warehousing etc because everything's bottled here in Camelton at the distillery all the warehousing is in Camelton. And do you find that that geographically 
um, either your this you know, your location comes on general or your you know distance from your vicinity near the near the lock. Yeah. Um, do you find it so. on, on maturation or? Yeah, very much so because yeah, yeah, spring mine can be described as a kind of that salty, briny, earthy note to it, and yeah, location is down to that. Yeah, and sometimes yes, you can go down the route even further with the type of warehousing because the likes of our bond number three, which is a total dunnage earthy that warehouse, um, has got that damp, musty notes that are coming through in the whiskey. So the location. And the type of warehousing is a huge factor in the final product. So, yeah. I must say, I'm, I'm really enjoying that 15. The nice kind of toffee, kind of almondy on the on the nose, um, like very chocolatey, kind of almost leathery. Then on the finish, it's it's a it's a phenomenal whiskey. It's um, a, yeah. It's, it's one nice. you want to sit back and keep on going back to it. Mm. Step away. And also the texture, the mouthfeel. You know, it's it's something. That uh, <clears throat> when I used to do tastings, you'd always say, you know, that that touch, that that physicality of the whiskey is is, is just as important as everything else. And the fifteen has it in bucket loads, like it's brilliant. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's got everything in the glass. You know, it's nice complexity to it, maturity, nice sort of sweetness to it. Yeah, very much so. Brilliant. Well, folks, we'd love to hear your uh, your your thoughts as well at home. Um, so tell us what we have here, Grant. So this is, a, this is one of the famous Springbank computers. Uh, so this is the, the bin room. So after we've done the kilning process, this is where we will store the malted barley um, before we go into the milling stage. So 10 malt bins, each bin holds about 20 tonnes of barley. So two malt floors fit perfectly into one bin. And that's basically, this is the simple chalkboard system if it's market full, empty, if it's spring bank, long row, here's the one. So, yeah, even the, the malted bar that we use for Glengyle is done here at spring bank as well. So, yes, we do constantly throughout the year a continuous malting process. Now, one of the reasons previously what we've done was two months malting, two months stilling, because you've got to let the barley sit or settle in here for approximately two months before you can go into the milling stage. After the kilning stage, process the barley goes into shock so if you go straight into the milling to mashing process you're not going to get the full benefit of all the sugars and stuff like that so you let the barley settle in here for approximately two months and that works perfect as it roughly takes two months to fill them that first bin will be ready to go into the into the mill sort of straight away after this so. uh, we've got a few comedians that work at the distillery as well because i used to do the tours at the spring bank and come around oh the famous spring bank computer and some one of the malts been wrote Dale at the top and plug in after use at the bottom. So it's a yeah, famous spring bank computer. I was doing a tour once and gave that story, and then somebody goes, Oh, and there's the mouse for the computer. And I'm like, mouse, what are you talking about? Turn around. Somebody went and put a dead mouse on top of the, the board. And I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, I was uh, mortified doing the tour. The guy found the funny side of it, thankfully. Um, I just turned on, well, we've got mice at the silly. If we've got mice, we don't have rats. So we'll just move on. <laughs> but yeah, the mouse for the computer. Oh dear. Um, most equipment we use at distilleries from a uh, sort of Porteous, uh, uh, old company founded in Leeds in England, and basically the company went bankrupt. Made everything so well, very very low maintenance, easily stripped down, rebuilt, and recalibrated. So this is where we grind the malted barley into grist. Inside here, there's three sets of rollers. Put the barley through and grinds it into sort of grist. So we're traveling before we put it into the mash tun. Oh, look at that wee video, what we've got here. Yeah, so what you see in there is before the, the barley goes through the mill, it goes up to what we call a dresser or a de-stoner. It's a big sieve-like system that takes away all the stones, all the mice, so only malted barley is getting dropped through the mill. And uh, that sort of bucket, it works in a sort of cantilever system, gets a certain weight and then it opens up and drops a, a set load through the mill. So it's not constantly 
feeding malted barley into the mill. It only does it in so a kind of bucket at a time, shall we say. Yeah, very, very old fashioned. Um, that was the, the, the grist there looks very fine. Um, yeah, I've seen most of the, the, the flour there, certainly, but yeah, it's usually the sort of same, similar sort of process that a lot of distillers are looking for. Uh, you're looking for mostly the middles, about 70% middles, 20% uh, of the husks outside, and then about 10% of the flour is what the usual kind of distillers look for. Mm -hmm. and that all depends how close you put the rollers to together. But yeah, a lot of the, the flour will kind of sit on that, that rake or the, the front of the door. So that's not actually getting dropped through and taken through to the, the, the grist bin. But, and actually a few local bakers have actually used that flour for making bread. It actually worked really well as well. There you go. There's the, the mash tun. So this is where we put the, the grist. So we put about three and a half tons of the grist into the mash tun and then we put four lots of hot water through the three and a half tons of grist. Now this is an old fashioned cast iron uh, mash tun. Uh, it's an old fashioned rack and pinion turning gear. A lot of people talk about semi louter or fully louter mash tuns. This is the old fashioned rack and pinion. So it's this a kind of paddle system inside, which I'll show in a minute, uh, turning the, the water and the, the grist together. So mix all the water so we can extract all the sugars out of the, the grist. Can you see the top of the paddles there? And that's um, just filling up. A lot of steam comes off. So fill up the, the mash tun and then I'll start the paddle system and then just basically turn all the, the water and the grist together. When we're draining away the that sugary water slush, solution, it's called wort and that gets pumped up into the wash bags. This again, a beautiful smell comes off it, but the hot water and the grist getting mixed together it is just, it's like, it's like porridge. It's a mm. beautiful sort of sweet smell coming through. And that's a, that sugary water solution kind of getting drained off. You don't see it in the, in the pictures I've got, but uh, when we drain away the, the wort, it goes into a tank and there's a simple float in the tank. And this float is connected to a bit of string with a, uh, basically as a rock tied to it. And as the, the float rises, the, the string goes down so we know the, the level of the tank. Great technology, and it, you know, <laughs> simple. You know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So that's them draining away the water I'm left with it. So after we've done the four waters through the, the grist, that's now called draft. And that draft goes up to a draft tank, and a local farmer will come in and take it away for cattle feed. Behind the scenes. Simple as. And uh, that's the tank outside. So after we've done the, the draft, stored in that draft tank, farm will come in 
and dry below it and then you'll fill up the, the trailer and take the, the draft away for cattle feed. So nothing goes to waste. So that sugary water solution is pumped up into the washbacks. Uh, we've got six washbacks. Each washback holds about 25,000 litres. What we do is put in about 21,000 litres of wort and then 75 kilograms of distillers of yeast to start the fermentation process, converting the sugars into alcohol. Now we do a very long fermentation. We're actually up to about 110 hours in the fermentation process. A lot of distillers might only do about 50 hours, but we all do up to about 110. One of the reasons behind that is we feel a longer fermentation results in a fruitier style of spirit. Um, I've heard that, that uh, maybe you can confirm or deny it, a lot of the, the fermentation times, uh, once you're going over 50 hours, is often due to just how it works, how it falls in terms of shift work. Um, that, you know, if, if, a, if a shift is coming on on a certain time, then it's a, it's a 78 hour fermentation time because it works out that, way, that best way with the staff. But then, you know, obviously it's, it's sold in, in, in a different way. Um, you know, yeah. saying what we do it for X reason, even though the reality is it's just a part Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, so we say up to 110 hours. You're quite rightly so, because, uh, yeah, shift pattern. So some of it might be about sort of 78, 90 hours. Um, but yeah, it all depends on the shift pattern. So it's, it's, it's all over 78 hours uh, fermentation, um, but up to 110, as I say. So yeah, um, quite like so. It all depends on the shift pattern. But, but you know, I, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean to take away from the the idea of it being 110 hours. I think that's you know the, the practicality of it is also part of the beauty in it. Like you know, these are these are are you know things that we have to think of when we're when yeah. we're very much so. Yeah, I mean that's it because uh, well we've got uh, six salmon that work in teams of two uh, on shift, so only two on shift at one time. One person will be doing, keep an eye on the mast tan and the washbacks, and then another person is keeping an eye on the stills. And yeah, and it all depends on chef. We don't uh, distill over the weekends. So, so yes, if we've got stuff in the washbacks, uh, we're not distilling again until that chef on Monday morning. So, so yeah, that's where that extra that day comes from because of basically the kind of sat we, we would fill up the, the washbacks. But there's that extra day for the basically for that say that because we don't distill distillers who maybe are doing twenty four seven distillation right through the weekends. Yes, it might be able to say exactly uh, say one hundred ten or 40, 78 hours fermentation. But we all we vary it because of we don't distill over the weekends. Very good. Are we ready to go on to number three? I think we might be. What's everyone think? Everyone's quiet in the chat today. Um, normally after two whiskeys though, people start getting a bit loose with the with the fingers. So hopefully that happens. Uh, we've got a question there from Thomas before we come on to, to number three, Grant, who says, uh, what is it like living in Campbelltown? Um, when I visited, I was surprised by how remote it felt, even though it's on the mainland. He's obviously never been to Ballyn the but there you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, well, born, lived here all my life. Um, I'm not a big city fan. Um, so, like, when I, I went to Paisley University just outside Glasgow and then stayed there for about three years during my university time, um, I couldn't wait to get back to Campbellton. I enjoy it because of basically what we have on our doorstep, you know, lovely beaches, you know, great for walking. We've got, I'm not a golfer, but we've got brilliant golf courses here. I used to do a lot of fishing when I was younger uh, in rivers and in the sea. So yeah, we've got so much to hear. Yes, you might, there's no big well, supermarket, why we've got a Tesco's and then we've got a co-op supermarket, but there's no big shopping malls to go like, for your, you know, your supermarket, you know, but your shopping trips, you've got to go to Glasgow. Um, but yeah, I enjoy living in Camelton. Um, my family, I've got a big brother and big sister, they've both moved away from Camelton, live in the cities, but for myself, no, a country bumpkin. I like living here and yeah, you get used to it. I mean, for me, obviously traveling around the UK and the location of Camelton, I've got to, you know, basically three hours to Glasgow before you go anywhere. So any travel and trip wise throughout the UK, I've got that three hour trip before I go to, you know, to get to Glasgow and then so I usually think, where, what, 
How long does it take me to get to Dorset, Dublin, the east, the south coast from Glasgow? Not from Camelton, because I've got to do that three hour journey anyway. Um, and that's uh, and I don't mind driving. I'll jump in the car and drive, sit driving 10, 10 hours quite easily. Quite happy, get the music on and sort of drive. Whereas other sales guys will drive to Glasgow airport, and fly somewhere, uh, but not me, I'll jump in the car. Quite happy. I used to work in the, the Irish ferry. It used to be a ferry service from Camelton to Ballycastle. Uh, I used to work on that as well when, during my university time as well, which was it was quite good fun. Uh, that lasted only lasted three years. That's uh, the route, but yeah, it was good. Uh, during that time, I even visited Bush Mills and stuff like that when I was working in the Irish ferry and stuff like that, up to the Giants Causeway and stuff like that. So, all good fun. But yeah, no, I love I love Camelton and my family. And that's Parents that are still here as well, so I can't complain. Yeah. No plans of moving away. I have a friend who who's not a city fan either. He he hates Liverpool as well. But um, sorry, bad joke. <laughs> but um, so we're coming on to the eighteen-year-old next, are we? Yes, we are. So let's bring my eighteen-year-old. Now, we have the, the latest batch of this one. Um, so this one was bottled in September last year. Uh, so this one here is a mixture of bourbon and sherry cask maturation. It's 45% bourbon and 55% sherry casks. Uh, usually about 8,000 bottles of the Spring Bank 18 year old bottled once a year. That's a normal sort of outturn for the Spring Bank 18 year old. Normally, we can say that our limited releases, like so we do Spring Bank, the local barley, the longer reds, it's usually about 9,000 bottles we try and get uh, to put onto the market. Anything sort of small on that is very hard to do sort of allocations and stuff like that. So it's usually about 9,000 bottles we are kind of aiming for for our limited releases. And we've got a couple of questions already there about the colour. Um, it's very different uh, on the 18. It's unusually light. Um, is that the, simply the bourbon influence or? Yeah, I mean, certainly. Yeah, I mean, the, so mostly the makeup for this one, yes, it's mostly, it's got bourbon and sherry. Uh, it's got mostly sherry, but most of the second fill sherry casks used for this one here and, you know, get more kind of first fill bourbon casks. So again, in the nose and palate, I'm even looking at the colour. It is a nice a golden amber. It's not too dark in colour, but yeah, all comes from the, the cast makeup from it. You know, first and second cast. So, and the nose and palate, yeah, it's a nice sort of balance between the bourbon and sherry influence. You know, it's a sort of lovely vanilla notes to it. Got a nice sort of toffee, cinnamon sort of note to it as well. Sort of pear drops on the nose. And then so sort of, it comes quite creamy on the the palate as well. Mm. No, it's it's uh, gorgeous. It's got a lovely finish to it. Gordon says it's a very fresh piney nose. Um, no, it definitely is. It's so I think that even this one here, for me, the you know, get a little bit more peat smoke coming through. It's amazing the different expressions we do, and some will bring through a bit more peat smoke influence than others. Um, yeah, and generally speaking, normally as you're maturing, you're losing some of the peat smoke influence, but it all depends on the cast makeup, etc. Um, but yeah, this one here for me certainly there's even more peat smoke coming through in the aftertaste. Yeah, I can I can definitely see that peat smoke in relative to the to the first two. Um, obviously, compared to some whiskies, I, I still find the peat in this very hard to detect. I find it very lemony, very citrusy on the nose. But I don't know if anyone else gets that. Yeah, certainly. We hints of coffee as well on the palate, sort of stewed. Plums, a bit orange. Mm. Obviously, sort of maturation. There's no, there's no alcohol burn. Main nose prickle. A lot of people that you know, you try and take a good sort of sniff of the whiskey, you might get that alcohol burn in your nose. It's not there. Even in the palate, there's no harsh alcohol jumping out, crying out, "Please add water to me." Very, very smooth in the palate.
So the picture here, we can see Springbank's got three stills. And this is going to be where the second difference between the three styles of spirit we produce. So Hazeburn is was unpeated, it's also triple distilled. So it is more like an Irish or a lowland style to it. Uh, Symbolise from the, the washbacks into the wash still, distilled once, twice and three times. So the more times it distills, a lighter, fruitier characteristic you're getting through from it. The wash still is very unique for us. It's actually got a direct flame heated source underneath and steam coil. So it's got two heating sources in the wash still. The two spirit stills I've got the steam coils inside for the heating process. But yeah, our wash still is very, very unique. In fact, it's got two. Back in the 60s, uh, it was converted from a coal fire to an oil burner. So that red box in front of it, that's the that's the the burner for it, the oil burner, which back the in the day. Spring bank, sorry, excuse me for there. The spring bank is, is triple distilled, is it? Spring bank is two and a half. Two and a half, right. So yes, this is the so. Because that was my, I thought, I thought in my head, they, it was, it was hazel burn was the triple distilled, and then long grow and the spring bank were, were double, I suppose. So yeah, so here's one triple spring bank is two and a half. So what we do with spring bank is take your wash from the wash bags into the wash still, and distill some of that, and you get your low wines coming off. Take some of your low wines, put it into the second still and you get your faints coming off. So what we then do is take 80% faints, 20% low winds, and put that into the third still and distill that and take your middle cut from that. So the middle cut, some of that spirit has been still three times, some only twice, hence two and a half times distilled. Very good, excellent. That was wasting everybody's confused face. That's a, yeah, simple as, uh, for spring bank, some of it is distilled twice and some of it three times. So it's a partial triple distillation, a mixture of your low wines and your faints for that final distillation run. Because there is, um, one other distillery does a, is it Morflock? Yeah, they've got a wee witchy still and they do the 2.88, which is something very similar, actually, yeah. We don't, we don't do the math <laughs> and work it out exactly. We say two and a half. It's not quite two and a half, but it's close enough to us. No, I don't know, but it's brilliant. It's excellent. Yeah, and it, it works. And people ask us, why is it always, you know, why is it done that way? And we say, because it's always been done that way. Mm. A chairman who is in his 80s, he's always done this two and a half times distillation. He knows his father and grandfather has always done this two and a half times distillation. So that's always continued. In likes of Hazelburn, we started doing back in 1997. Um, we've done that because Frank McCarty, back then he was a distillery manager. He worked at Springbank left and went to work in uh, Bush Mills, worked at Bush Mills for about 10 years and came back to Springbank in 1997 and says, why don't we do this triple distilled style of spirit? And, and that's where that came from. Long Row we started doing back in 1973. And that was basically a kind of argument with somebody from Isla saying you can't make peaty whiskey off of Isla. And the chairman was like, yes you can, you just need peated barley. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we started doing the long row is a, to prove the point you can. And the fact is we were back then, we were producing a lot of blends and using a lot of peated whiskey for our blends. So we're buying in peated single malts. So why not make it ourselves? Mm. And then after a few years of maturing away, well, this is actually really, really good. We can bottle this as a, a single malt. And that's where the long row range was, we came from. And doing the three, three styles. There you go. No, I'll just say we have a few comments there before we come on to more than the stills. I know that um, there was one parting comment. Oh. Sorry. Um, I don't know how to stop that. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Um, as I say, it's not my laptop, as I said at the start. The... So I can't bring the comments back up now. It's uh, playing off on me. Ah, there we go. Um, sorry about that, folks. Technical difficulty. Uh, Simon says definitely getting the dried fruit from the 15, and he found a big difference with a drop of water on the 15 too. Um, so I thought that was an interesting comment from earlier. I wanted to come back to. Um, Bob has a great comment on the 18, where he says to me the 18 is has all the magic of the 12 year old cast strength, uh, which he love, which he loves. The silky leather of the finish walks through the back of the throat, disappears, and literally reappears on the throat and disappears. 
Um, then he says he actually meant to say the 15, not the, the 12 year old. So do you mean you're saying the 18 year old has the magic or the 15 year old has the magic? Uh, Bob, if you want to. Um, and Thomas says, whenever I have the hazel burn, I find it slightly peated. Uh, this, I suppose, is more directly related to our discussion on the stills. Uh, I know the barley that is used for it is not peated. Does it come from the residue from the previous distillations of peated malts? Um, so maybe you could come on to that one, Grant, before you, we, we continue talking about the stills. So it was that Hazelburn, was it? That was the Hazelburn. He finds that there's a, there's a slight peat in this after yes. Hazelburn. Yep, so uh, yeah, Hazelburn is totally unpeated, but because the, the barley is dried in a kiln that uses peat, uh, there is going to be a very slight peaty influence to it. So yes, um, to us, yes, it is unpeated, but there is, some people do recognise there's a wee bit of peat smoke in the background, and that's just because it's dried in a kiln that has peat. We're not going to fully clean out the kiln every time. We do our best. Normally what we try and do at the start of the year is we'll do Hazelburn first and then Springbank and then Long Row. So there's no point in going from Long Row straight into Hazelburn. Obviously using the peat reek uh, into that kiln. Um, so yeah, we try and clean out as best we can, but uh, yes, the kiln's got a peat smoke influence into it because. Well, I imagine it's, a, it's an incredibly hard smell. I mean, like we, like I grew up around peat and turf, like, you know, down here in South Kerry and my, grandparents we used to cut turf every summer in the bog um and uh and the, the stove at home was always powered with with, with peat and the, my grandparents house uh still to this stage you know it carries that smell um that peat smell in, in everyone's you know in your jacket if you've been in there for for a few hours and you leave and you know even in the height of summer um the, the fire is always going in there over the stove and you 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 know that that peat smell just dominates so you know, I imagine when, once the still, once the kiln is finished, it's 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 very hard to, to get rid of that residue, you know, because it, it really does so. get yeah. into everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the things I can remember growing up in Camelton is I used to think, oh, what's that smell? And uh, because of the, the molten process and the kiln working away, the, the smoke, it kind of, on certain days, that uh, peat smoke will kind of hover over the town if there's not much of a breath of wind in it. And I used to always wonder when I was like, what is that smell? And then starting working with in the company, that's what I used to smell when I was a, when I was a lad. Uh, so yeah, and you think that was one distillery. What was the town like with over 30 distilleries producing? Because mm. a lot of distilleries done their malting process themselves back in the day. So it, yeah, and it does, it clings to you. We've got an interesting one. Uh, we, we do, uh, an open day every year at the distillery and the night before the kind of open day we usually we started must have been about 10 years ago we do this kind of fancy dinner where we invite people down the pay uh, to have the, a fancy dinner within the distillery grounds and they get a special bottle at the end of it for the people who attended the dinner. One year we had it inside the kiln so we managed to Watch it all, we can get 30 people in the kiln and have this sort of three course fancy meal served to them after a nice sort of whiskey taste and they pick the whiskey, the, the favourite choice one and everybody got a hand bottle uh, drawn from this cast for them type thing. Because it was inside the kiln, but two days prior to the, the dinner, the kiln was used. So everybody came out, uh, so they sort of peed right <laughs> off them. But they were they were loving it, absolutely loving it. But yes, yeah, so they were just totally covered in a sort of peat smoke influence. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was it was quite funny. They all they all absolutely loved it. Um, so one year we had it inside the still house, one year inside a warehouse, and yeah. Um, so every year we try and pick a different location within the distillery grounds for this this dinner before the the night before the open day. Quite really good. Fantastic. So yeah, so that, that's a spring mix two and a half times. Long row is only double the still, so that we don't use the third still for a long row. It's only the first and second still for a long row, so it's traditionally double distilled. The wash still, old fashioned, that's the age of it. We don't know exactly the age of it, but but you can just look. It's still riveted together. That section of it there. Um, this, you know, it's, I think it's over 100 years old. They don't know exactly, but it's it's still riveted together. Whereas most stills nowadays are nice, sort of clean welds on them. And they it, it, it's lasted that long. Um, would the copper not wear through in the middle, or the middle's not too bad because we've got a rummager. 
on the wash still, there's a bottom section and they've got a chain system scraping away. So yes, the bottom section got replaced in the 60s because of that's constantly uh, worn away. We've also just replaced part of the line arm a couple of years ago. Um, and that again, we've got a little bell system. It tells that chain system is all connected in. You'll see more pictures of that in a minute. That had to be replaced uh, because of, it was getting worn down. But that section here, that's uh, the, the kind of top of the onion, shall we say, bell. But uh, yeah, it's not a problem at all. So that section is, is over 100 years old. That's amazing because you hear stories um, when, when all the Irish distilleries were closing in the 50s and 60s and even earlier than that, but mostly the ones that were that, that survived into that time period when Irish whiskey was, was just completely collapsing. Um, one of the stories I've often heard, and I don't know how true these are, you hear these stories and you don't know how to verify them. Do you know what I mean? I studied history and I, you know, you're kind of thinking, how many sources do we have for that <laughs> comment? So I've, I always feel a bit nervous passing, on, passing them on when I hear them. But one of the things I often heard was that the state of the stills at the time was, 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 was one of the things that driving the closures because you know, they wasn't seen. It's one thing if you can keep tipping away, maybe distilling a couple of months out of the year or something. Um, but when the stills need replacing, if they're wearing away and, and it's not stripping out the sulfur and your, your whiskey starting to degrade, it's a big investment getting, you know, replacing all your copper stills, you know, or, yeah. or mending them. So it's, it's going to obviously have a massive economic impact on your decision to, to plow on or not, like, you know. Very much so, yeah. I mean, certainly we've been very lucky. Um, again, for many years, Springbank technically was only producing six months of the year because of the fact we were like two months malting, two months stilling, two months malting. And that was the way it was for many, many years. Um, so the stills were never overworked, shall we say. So that again, that had a, ended up worked in our favour. If they were 24-7 using the stills, then yes, they probably would have a shorter lifespan. But uh, this being kind to them, um, it certainly is, is much in a favour, shall we say. Is the, that in the sixties the the wash stills were replaced like for like, so they're nice sort of clean welds and that on them. I mean that's again we don't know the age of this photograph, but you can see the original, so the top section riveted together. I mean that top section was replaced in the sixties, but the the bottom the rivets, yeah, we reckon over a hundred years old for that bottom section of the, the stills. That's brilliant. So that's inside the, the wash still. So that's what you call the rummager. That's the, the chain system. Because of that direct flame heating source underneath, uh, you've got this rummager scraping away at the bottom so the wash doesn't stick to the, the bottom of the stills. And then you see the, the steam coils inside there as well. Um, because we've got... <coughs> It works. That is connected to the, the rumminger. So obviously it's inside the stills. We don't know if the rumminger is working or not. So that chain system is connected to this part here and that bell tells us it's just done a full circle and it's working away perfectly. So, so yeah, we are into oh, the tourist spring you hear this little bell, that's what the bell is. Brilliant. How, com how common would this type of rubber system be in, in, in Scotch situations? Basically, if you had direct flame heating source underneath, very, very common because of the, the new, the wash is going to start sticking to the bottom. So that rubber is making sure the wash doesn't stick. So yeah, if you were direct flame heating source, which ne nearly all the stillies were back mm. in the day, uh, you had a rubber scraping away at the bottom. If you've got the steam coils, you don't need that rubber. So if you, more modern, still is now it'll have just have steam coils inside very very few distillers still uh, do the direct flame heating source underneath mm -hmm. oh very good uh we have a question there from from thomas again grant did you have any uh, old spring bank uh from the days when you were still using coal fire stills uh if so was there a big difference in taste yeah i mean certainly i'm lucky enough May, when was it? About well, 10 years ago, I tried the, the 1919 Springbank. It was 50 years old, um, the Springbank. And so, yes, trying that, but it was a 50 year old Springbank, so it had a lot of cask in, but it was quite a lot of woodiness to it. But so, yes, if you 
many years ago, I was lucky enough to try some of the like the '66 local barley, which were dated when we changed the, the kind of the kind of more modern sort of coal burn uh, oil burner, so we say. But uh, during that time, I I did try older whiskies that was pre the the conversion, and yeah, there is a slight difference. Um, not because over the years you can learn the sort of the, the slight variations. You can't really forget what the old sort of style is, um, but there was a slight difference when, in changing, and that's where you know people saying that putting in new stills and or expanding and putting in different to say or oh, going for light flight. They're always going to have a slight variation uh, in flavour profile, adding new stills to the into the portfolio and stuff like that. So, it's, so that's why we spring back three stills. It's always light for light if anything needs replaced. So we're saying, so we're trying to minimise any sort of flavour change and uh, any changes whatsoever. So, but yes, there was a slight change, but very, very slight. It's, uh, it certainly had to be done. It's, that's the Spirit Safe. So all the three stills are connected to the Spirit Safe. So on the left, the, the wash uh, for the for low lines coming through, and then your faints in the middle one, and then at the end you can turn it for you, doing your middle cut. In the second window there, you can see there's little thermometers. So every so often the stillman will check, check the temperature and the density of the spirit, so he can work out the alcohol content, so he knows when to do all the, the middle cuts. So the middle cut's slightly different for the three productions we do. The Springbank middle cut is 76 down to 60. Long row is 69 down to 58. Hazelburn is 79 down to 63% alcohol. So that's it. Again, because you're doing that different distillation, you can get the, the variation of the strength of alcohol, but the middle cuts are slightly different for the three productions you produce. 80% uh, of our production goes towards Springbank, 10% for Long Row, and 10% for Hazelburn. So yeah, Springbank is the main focal point. We're doing Long Row and Hazelburn. We are catering for all styles. Um, for everybody's got different palettes, shall we say? And you know, we've, some people come up to me at trade shows. or oh, I like something that's uh, unpeated uh, and bourbon cast. Hazelburn 10 for you, or something else might come up. I like nice sort of peaty smoky influence, a bit of sherry cask, or spring, or maybe the long row 18 for you, it's nice peaty, a bit of sherry cask influence. So we can cater for all markets, doing the three products and the age profiles with the different cask makeup for it as well. Are we ready to move on to number four? I think we are. I, asked, I just literally just before you said that I snuck I snuck a pour of pour of the twenty one year old myself. This is a cracking dram. The colour is phenomenal. It is phenomenal. It's funny that in the office we always get a bottle of whiskey for opening for tasting purposes. It's about my eighteen year old opened there end of last year. Twenty one year old opened the end of last year. <laughs> like nearly empty. <laughs> it must have been that good. Everyone went back to more. more. So yes, this is the Springbank 21 year old. Uh, it's a cracking drum. Um, it's just the flavour profile, the nose, depth, complexity to it is just to die for. I mean, you can, it's one of these whiskies you can sit and just nose all night long. No, it certainly is. So you said that there was a, a, a twist to this year's edition, or this yeah, year. it is. The, so there's only every year there's usually about three thousand three hundred bottles of Springbank Twenty One Year Old. No, so like twenty one years ago, cash were just filled into the distillery, and so our distillery manager we were kind of doing, can we, like what we what we got for bottling for Springbank Eighteen, what we got for bottling Springbank Twenty One. So when we was looking at the Springbank Twenty One Year Old, he had bourbon, rum, sherry, and port. So this year's makeup with a 21 year old is 30% bourbon, 30% rum casks, 25% sherry casks, and 15% port. Normally it's got mostly just some bourbon and sherry, mostly sherry towards bourbon. But yeah, this year there is some rum cask used and some port cask used in the mix. Exciting. 
And yeah, it has created a wonderful, wonderful drama. Uh, yeah, cracking. And yeah, so that's one thing we're kind of trying to control more because every year we're filling so many bourbons, so many sherry, so we can control our future releases to be a bit more controlled. People do love the, the quirky releases from Springbank, um, you know, that, and you know, this year Springbank 21 year old was all got that port and the sherry and the rum influence to it, or last year was mostly bourbon towards sherry. People do like that and people start asking us, oh, you know, the Springbank 21 for instance, it doesn't have a date when it was bottled. And people ask us, when, how do I know what year it was bottled? And people start looking for the little, the operation number that's stamped on the, the back of the, the bottle so they can tell you when it was bottled and stuff like that. So years ago, that number was hand stamped onto the back of the label. Uh, the first two digits corresponding to the, the year of bottling. Um, and that's one way to try and sort of look for people phones up. Oh, can you tell us when this old spring bank is bottled? Look for this operation number on the back of the, the bottle um, and then we'll get the, the year of bottling from that. And then that, that operation number, we can tra trace it right back to what casks were used for bottling that, that, that product in case there's any basically traceability, uh, if any problems occur to it and say, oh, what casks were used? That cast went to that operation. Kind of deal. But, well, so yeah, three thousand three hundred bottles. A phenomenal, phenomenal drop. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. I had I had the Springbank twenty five year old a few years back, and I didn't think it got better than that. But this is this is really special. Some fantastic taste notes coming in as well. Uh, Thomas's blackberry and heather honey in abundance on the nose. That's blackberries. I get blackberries in the finish. It's it's amazing. Uh, and heather on the nose to Simon as well. So that's a, a clearly. Uh, a, a common one. That's a no. That's a that's a it's a gorgeous whiskey. Um, yeah, that's worth the price of the tasting alone. <laughs> oh, it is. Yes. When I heard this one's going to be in the tasting, I'm like, perfect. That's good. I like this one. I mean, they're all cracking drams. Yeah, to be fair, but uh, it is one of the like a standout dram. So back to some of the pictures here. I've got this is one the the yard at Springbank. So all the empty casks stored outside. Uh, keep them normally keep them nice and wet because nearly all, always rains in Camden. But this picture was taken on a sunny day, uh, and filling the casks. So all the casks will be rolled in one at a time and filled by hand. Normally, what we'll do is weigh an empty cask, fill it, and then the weight again. So, so the weight difference they can work out the. The, the contents of it, and then it'll be stenciled to so like that cask, filled in 1996. Uh, cask number is 470, and there's 250 litres of it into that hogshead. This is a number three bond. This is one of the traditional earth, and this is what, actually the oldest warehouse we've got on site. This is the, the Dunnage Earthen Floor Warehouse. It's only three high, and it's quite an unusual warehouse, in fact. Uh, the temps of change in this one is huge. During the winter months, some of the casts will have frost on top of them in a cold winter's morning, and then during the summer, it gets quite hot in this warehouse. So that has actually got a you know, change to the... the the maturation process to it but yeah this one here has got a kind of damp earthy note to it and people do say that this is the best warehouse for maturing spring in and then it's just another warehouse they've got to hoist the cast up that's a recent photo so yeah 2020 yeah only problem is he's not wearing his hard hat Health and safety man. <laughs> or, or, his, or his face mask, like Jesus. Yeah. You see all the different sizes. Uh, so it is mostly bourbon and sherry cast we use. It's, nowadays it's mostly um, hogshead sherry cast we use, but the, there is some uh, butts purchased in occasionally. Uh, so there's usually kind of barrels, which are about 200 litres. A few, few larger, you know, butts or or port pipes or something port in there. Pipes. You can see a port pipe in the left hand side there. Yeah, I was wondering if that was, yeah. And then maybe, is that one in the middle of the right or? Is it is, it? Yeah. 
So you can see the difference with a quick glance at them. The port pipes are like a longer sort of um, mm. a narrow ends to them from the sherry butts. So yeah. Very good. Cracking powder. Yeah. So we're now moving into the, the bottling side. So yeah, even bottling on site, uh, every bottle of Springbank is handled numerous times in the bottling operation. This is one of the, our quality control measures. Uh, when we fill the bottles up, we put the bottle up to a light box to make sure there's no sediment uh, or any spiders into the bottle before they, they go on down the, the bottom line. So every bottle has done that, yeah. There's a, a little video here. So about five, six years ago, we had to sort of invest in our bottling hall side of things. Basically because our bottling hall, everything used to be hand bottled fully by hand. And the time consuming factor in it, we, it was a bit of a, pardon the pun, a bottleneck coming to the bottling side of things. We were struggling to get things bottled to get out to our suppliers. And we wanted to keep everything bottled on site in Camelton and we had to go down the route of putting in this sort of semi-automated bottling line. So yeah, you can see that it fills the, the bottles for us and puts the cork in. If you went to Springbank six years ago, it was basically somebody had to physically put the bottles up. The filling head had four, filled four bottles at a time and then every cork was put in by hand. So we had to invest in this machinery basically because we were struggling to keep up with demand, getting the whiskey bottled in time for going out for orders, etc. So we still got the old fashioned line. So we actually employed more, because a lot of people said, oh, you, does that mean you're going to make, do some redundancy, pay people off? Not at all, because we kept the old fashioned line in, we employed more people, because now we can actually have the two lines operating at once. So we can do, we use the larger line for, say, Bottling Spring Mike 10, 12 year cast strength, 15, sort of bigger runs. Whereas the smaller single cast all done on the, the smaller line. So it's, we can speed things up and get things bottled much faster. Um, and have you done any bottling for third parties? We've not. Uh, again, we, our bottling hall are chock a block um, because the bottle all cadden head products, the gin, and stuff as well, the rums they do, the cognac and stuff. So all the Cadenhead range is bottled here as well. So yes, they, they're kept full time. And sometime, uh, I mean last year, there, a couple of times they had to go into overtime just to, depends if we had a busy dispatch schedule. Um, so yeah, we're, we, we don't really have the facilities for doing it as well. Um, so we, it's all bottled just for ourselves. Um, occasionally we'll go, and prior to 2001, we used to sell casts to private individuals. So we used to have a lot of casts owned and they kind of bottled here in the distillery as well. So at one point we had over 2000 casts maturing away at Springbank owned by other individuals and they could have done whatever they wanted for them. And most of them were bottled now certainly, but uh, we were quite busy bottling single casts for private customers that we sold casts to many years ago. So the, the, the older Caddenhead bottles, were they been um, hand filled as well? Yeah, uh, so I mean Caddenhead uh, was bought by Springbank uh, back in 1972 and since 1972 Caddenheads were bottled at Springbank and Camelton. So, so yes, any sort of, any, you've tried from Caddenheads uh, from 1972 onwards were bottled at Springbank. Yeah, I did not know that now. Right. And then that's the bottom line there. So, so yeah, uh, and that's just coming to the end of it. So yeah, so every bottle again, at the end of that line is picked up, a bit of quality control, make sure the label on straight, not back to front, etc. And then into the carton and then into the outer case. So there's about 17 people working in the bottling hall. Um, and that's the main problem we've got during the, this pandemic because back in 
March last year, we shut down the whole distillery, even the sales team were whole furloughed because uh, we couldn't operate. Um, the bottling hall is the main thing. If we didn't have any bottle, whiskey to be bottled, the sales team couldn't work. So the whole distillery was furloughed and we started looking into putting in control measures to to do social distancing, etc. Put in perspex screens, etc. And uh, the bottling hall operated again back in August. And so now we're in lockdown number two over here. We, we've actually continued production because we've got various control measures. Because what the, the bottling hall do now, they actually only work in shifts of seven people. It's two shifts um, and they can do things a wee bit slower than our normal wise, but we're, we can get whiskey bottles, which is the main thing, and continual production. Uh, which is have you found have you found that it that the pandemic impacted sales or the opposite? Well, there you go. You're actually that that's a, a common answer. There's a few people on. Um, I think only one one person we've had of all the places we've done has said that the pandemic has has had a negative impact on sales. So that's interesting. Yeah, we. I mean, okay, during the furlough. Um, wasn't meant to do any working, but I mean, the sales team have all got mobile phones and the emails pinging in. They just pop up the screen. Well, somebody else looking for more stock, somebody else looking for stock, somebody else looking for stock. Um, people have my number, phone me up, and say, oh, I'm furloughed, but uh, we don't have any stock because uh, we can't get anything dispatched type out to you. Because just before we furloughed, we managed to get some whiskey out, what we had available. And, uh, and that's the thing, when we went back to work in August, we had to wait basically a month to get build up a stock again before I could actually ship whiskey out. So that first month, I was back to work in mid July, and I didn't have any whiskey into basically September because the bottling hole started again in August. Okay, I could have maybe had one week I could have got spring my ten year old bottled, the next week fifteen old, but we waited till the end of the August before uh, I had whiskey the portfolio available again type thing. So, but yeah, demand is going crazy. And what we're finding is people who have got an online presence are doing very, very well. Uh, obviously, there's, there's no tourism trade for the footfall. Um, they are sort of suffering, certainly, uh, the ones who don't have an online trade. But so yeah, the ones who are got a, a good online business are, are doing very, very well. And it's not, it's a full range, um, which is fantastic. Um, Yes, there's a even bigger demand for the limited releases we do, but there's always is, is a demand there for our limited releases, but especially the, the core range is just crazy. We can't keep up with demand just now. And Jamie O'Connell asks, any Brexit impact yet? Um, it's now a lot of things is coming to light. Because um, I need to speak to Ali uh, soon regarding this, uh, because there is a lot of more paperwork that is now required and we're finding even this week that there's different label re uh, regulations for different countries and stuff like that. Um, but we had, you know, bottle of whiskey for many years, but that's the information for our European markets, which is fine, we're going out there, but now we're, they're saying this different countries, oh, I need that on the back label, I need this and this back label. Okay, we've, we've known that for, like for Switzerland, they've got to have the imported details and stuff like that. So we know that for certain markets, but anyway, but more and more for the European customers, because uh, of Brexit, they're finding different paperwork and labelling requirements. So I'll need to speak to Ali to see if there's anything required for Ireland. Well, I couldn't believe um, when it hit, when it kind of came into effect, how how how, few, a few, how many things that hadn't been kind of figured out. I mean, we're having issues with uh, our now the bar is closed because of, of the lockdown, but our card machine company is, is, is having issues with uh, how much VAT is allowed to be claimed back to the UK or not being claimed back to the UK and all these different companies, you know, so if, it's, if the sale under 70 uh, euros, they're not eligible for, for VAT back and, all, you know, all these kind of different things or, or if there's import duty being implied and, and some of the people we're shipping with aren't aware is, is it under 155 pounds that they're going to leave not uh, not impacted or if it's more than that is it you know all these little import charges and everything that i thought i just assumed as part of all these brexit talks they were going to be like this is what they were agreeing on and now no one seems to know what what the what it is yeah but we've 
mail order wise, we've at the moment we've stopped sending whiskey out of the UK because of nobody seems to know regarding what is required paperwork wise. And because we thought, okay, it'll just be a case of sending whiskey somewhere to out to Switzerland or something like that. But no, it's, it's nobody really knows. So mm. at the moment we're just saying, sorry, we can't ship anything outside the UK. Um, it's been a nightmare. And then last week I was speaking to one of my customers in Northern Ireland. Um, he was talking about a new, what he described as an XI number. Uh, and so he basically, he'd apply for it on his side, we'd apply for it on our side. And that's just because of the, the route the, the orders go across. Uh, and across. Mm. Nobody tells you these things. Yeah, no, it is crazy. I mean, I know. I look. I'm not in the shipping department, and and um, Celtic whiskey ships a lot, but it's you know, it's not. It's I've never, I've never even been to their shipping warehouse, even though I've worked for the company for, for for nearly uh, for over five years now. But um, but I know that they're having huge trouble with the UK um in that in that department um in terms of getting stuff out and and how long it's taking and you know even just regular shipping that's not being impacted but is being delayed. So it's it's mad. It's mad. Yes. Um. The Gordon Lawler in the chat says, any news on this year's Campbelltown Festival? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to announce it at the end of this month, but basically it's not going ahead. Um, we, we're going to the end of this month just to kind of confirm it in case there's any possibility. But at the moment we're saying no, because we want to, if it's not going ahead, we're going to do a virtual festival again. And if we start planning and preparing for a virtual festival, and then all of a sudden we can have a, an actual festival, all these plans and so everything we've got in place will be out the window. So the decision is going to be made, finalised by the end of this month, and we'll get it out to our customers. Unfortunately, not going ahead. We'll do a virtual one instead. But um, we're basically saying we're at moments so it's not going ahead, but that'll be confirmed by the end of this month. Perfect. And uh, going back to our, our our chat, our cask chat from earlier, Colin McCarthy says, "What would the largest cask be?" I'm assuming a regular cask is around 200 liters. So I believe he's right. 200 liters would be around a bourbon cask. Yeah. So bourbon hog says about 200 liters. Uh, hog says it's about 250 liters. Uh, a butt is about 500 litres. Some of the ruby port pipes we get in are about 550 uh, litres. That's about the biggest gas we use in the story. Very good. Uh, and uh, David has a comment on, on Kelly Mead that the Scotch whiskey, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society is shipping on hold. There's a bottle that he really wants and he's seeing the single digit stock dropping. So. No, it is. It's, uh, I suppose, first world problems, but it is Brexit impacting us all. It is, yeah. I mean, you know, the two going together, pandemic and the Brexit, I was like, just have a drink, you know, drive yeah. and drink. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, just have a drink. Just no? have Very good. Um, well, is there anything else you wanted to, to cover? That's, that's, that's covered everything. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's it. We basically do everything at the distillery, so an old fashioned working museum. The whole distillery, we employ about 90 people doing things the old fashioned way. And the company's now into a trust fund. Uh, about five years ago, the chairman, who, you know, he's getting on a bit, he's got other family members who will continue the family line, but he put this, the company into a trust fund. So all the profits go back into maintaining the distillery, keeping people into, into a job, doing things the old fashioned way. So it's very, very important for that. Um, so yeah, uh, credit to him. Um, so it's long may that continue and yeah, and certainly the way the company works, it's always a way of, right, what, what can we do more ourselves? Where can we employ people? And it's not just about where we can maximize profit as well. It's like, what we look at whiskey when put it onto market, how much does it cost to make this whiskey? What price do you want to sort of sell it at? And it's not a case of what can we get away with selling this product at? You know, it's, it's literally looked at what does it cost to make this whiskey? Because sometimes you'll see some of our limited edition products going for an auction site for silly, silly money. But are we selling them too cheap? So we know we're not because we know the cost of making it type of thing. 
Um, but there is because of there's a demand there for it. Some of the there is what we call flippers that'll buy it, put it away for maybe a year or six months, and put it into oxyte after that, and uh, make a wee bit of money for it. So, so yeah, there's a big demand for our, our products. But it's, spring bank's always been about it's made for drinking and enjoying, and that's mm -hmm. that's the great thing as well. It's a great product, great story behind it, and it's not a made up story. That's the great thing as well. It's there's no marketing bullshit behind it. It is literally good, honest, uh, reasonably valued whiskey, uh, which, yeah, it's, it's a cracking company to work for. No, it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. No, look, thank you very much and thank you to everyone who, who joined us. Um, I know a few of you have, have also bought packs for, for the long grow next week, so we'll hopefully see you again then and we'll see you again soon, Grant, as well for that. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So, brilliant. Any more questions, guys, or anything that, that I missed in the chat, um, do drop me a line um, on the, the same, CC'd into the same email that, that Julie sent out the, the Zoom link on. So if there's anything I missed uh, or any, anything you think of after the tasting you want to ask Grant, we can forward it on to him if there's any, anything. So yeah. thank you very much and we'll see you all again soon. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.